Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. With the Bad Batch well on its way, I thought it'd be a good idea to bring back one of our old series, the Star Wars Factions Breakdown. So far we've covered species like the Umbarans, the Wookiees, and the Twi'leks. Today we'll be taking a look at the Kaminoans and their biological, cultural, and technological strengths and weaknesses. The Kaminoans seem like a designer species. By designer, I mean someone clearly heavily modified every aspect of how they look. This is why the Kaminoans more or less look perfect as a species, or at least what their species perceives as perfect. At one point in time, the Kaminoans were like any other species, but then the end of an ice age brought about a disaster known as the Great Flood, which inundated the terrestrial world with one massive ocean. Ironically, it seems like the Kaminoans originally evolved from aquatic creatures, but when the flood hit, they were no longer adapted for watery environments. And so this natural disaster brought Kaminoan society to its knees. With very little land to now live on and being forced to build platforms in floating cities, the Kaminoans faced mass starvation and extinction. No one really knows what exactly happened during this dark period of time, but there are rumors and reports that they culled weaker members of their society, including the old and the weak, and at the same time, they did a lot of selective breeding. Within generations, though, it's clear the Kaminoans became obsessed with experimenting with genetics and cloning. Their species became supremely focused on creating the perfect images of themselves. And so all Kaminoans who were allowed to live, for better or worse, were perfect in their own species view, both aesthetically, physically, and mentally. This is why it's extremely rare to see a sick or mutated Kaminoan. Most of them were striking and extremely tall and lanky. The Kaminoans' massive almond eyes were also able to see things in the ultraviolet spectrum. And so while Typica City looked like a soulless Apple store and the clone armor looked like something sold in a soulless Apple store, the white paint that adorns these structures and objects are actually very vibrant and beautiful in the UV spectrum. While many of the Kaminoans adjustments to their own physiology through genetic engineering were practical and led to some improvements, there are also many aesthetic preferences that the Kaminoans had that were not exactly logical. For instance, eye color was extremely important for the Kaminoans and basically determined what their role in society would be. Now, if they had uh, green eyes, which was very rare, it was actually considered a danger to Kaminoan society and genetically inferior. And so babies with green eyes were usually killed when they were born. While well, Kaminoans were experts at genetic alteration, some of their less rational actions like this might have actually negatively affected their genetic pool. Obviously, having green eyes is just like, you know, a phenotype and doesn't really determine intelligence or, you know, personality or other important things that make up a living being. Also, because of their very thin and lanky nature, Kaminoans were quite a fragile species. They also had a very thin and easy to squeeze neck. And while Kaminoans were known for being rational, sometimes their pursuit of perfection would override that side of them, leading to waste of resources and time. Any society that grows through great hardship and sacrifice and calamity will develop some very positive attributes along with some negative attributes. Kaminoan society is extremely disciplined and orderly. There is a finely defined caste system and hierarchy that is adhered to by almost every member of society. Any outlier will either be shunned, or if they are a genetic outlier, they will be exterminated at birth. This kind of control over society ensures harmony and very little domestic stability issues. The Kaminoans also learned how to be very independent and only depend on themselves. When the Great Flood came, they didn't look for help from other planets. Instead, they solved the problem themselves. And even after they solved the Great Flood situation, they still remained a relatively isolated planet and people. The Kaminoan economy, for instance, was completely self-sustaining. Using technology, they were able to thrive on their harsh, watery world. And so the Kaminoans were usually in a pretty good position. The Galactic Republic always needed them more than they needed the Galactic Republic, and so they could maintain their sovereignty for most of galactic history. To outsiders, the Kaminoans are a mystery. Most individuals don't know about their planet or people, and upon seeing them for the first time, the Kaminoans are pretty intimidating. And that's because they're usually very controlled and reserved and extremely hard to read. They give off a sense of superiority because of their height and appearance, which really does help their branding as geneticists and cloners. 
What culture they did have, like the secretive Nahra dance, which is the only time in which Kaminoans expressed their emotions, were usually kept very closely guarded and away from outsiders. The Kaminoans don't want other species knowing anything about them. It was that same isolationism and xenophobia that also prevented the Kaminoans from offering their services to the wider galaxy sooner. Even though their products were far superior compared to the competition and would fetch a much higher price on the galactic markets, it took quite a lot of time for the Kaminoans to overcome this mentality of isolationism. Even after they started taking contracts from other worlds and species, the Kaminoans still maintained a very xenophobic view of outsiders, but luckily they had the tact to stay polite in front of clients. The reality was the Kaminoans saw themselves as superior to almost everyone, and the only species that they actually did have any respect for were species that tried to improve themselves. The problem with the Kaminoans' worldview and their view of their own species was that they believed they understood what perfection was. The arrogance of the Kaminoans, however, blinded them from the possibility that they could ever be wrong, which led them to overestimate their own abilities and the abilities of their enemies. And also because of the Kaminoan superiority complex, they never felt the need to actually make alliances with other species and depend on other species for anything. And so when their world is threatened, they don't really have any true allies to call on. I mean, the Republic existed during the Kaminoan's major Great Flood crisis, but the Kaminoans decided it'd be too big of a risk to ask for help from the Republic. And so they decided to tackle this issue on their own. The Republic only came to Kamino's aid during the Clone Wars because of the cloning facilities crucial to the war effort that were located on Tipica City. If the Kaminoans decide to rebel against the Empire, well, they'll be more or less on their own. The lack of humanity and kindness also hurt the Kaminoans' image. Most species that knew them didn't really like them and were distrustful of them. This is partly because the Kaminoans lacked any real exposure to the wider galaxy. Like the Umbarans, the Kaminoans kept to themselves and rarely left their home world. And because their society was based on a caste system, which was based on, you know, physical appearance, there was very little upwards mobility in their society. And so the Kaminoans had a surprisingly inefficient social system. So we already talked about what happens to people with green eyes in Kaminoan society. But what about all of the other eye colors? Well, gray eye color meant that you served in administration, and that was the top level. If you had yellow eyes, you were a skilled worker, which is like the medium level. And if you had blue eyes, you were doing manual labor and other manual tasks, and you are at the lowest level. This stringent culture and adherence to groupthink mentality also meant that the Kaminoans lacked diversity and flair from a cultural standpoint as well. And such things like a caste system really prevented them from reaching their max potential as a society. So Kaminoan culture has a problem with diversity, but at the same time, it was highly focused on one thing, making some of the best Genesis and clones in the galaxy. With so much energy focused on one specific craft, it's no surprise that the Kaminoan's cloning technology was superior to almost anything else in the galaxy. The Kaminoans would leverage the strength to get a very lucrative long-term clone trooper contract from the Republic and the Jedi. This contract alone will make multiple generations of Kaminoans filthy rich and secure. On top of that, Palpatine grants the Kaminoans a lucrative seat in the Senate as a result. Usually planets like Kamino would wait on a waiting list for hundreds, if not thousands of years for representation. Even then, most worlds don't get direct representation like Kamino and are instead represented by a system or a regional senator. While there are many different types of cloning facilities in the galaxy, the Kaminoans were always known for their attention to detail. If anything, they were like a boutique cloning agency that allowed for deep customization that the client would want. The Master Clone Trooper project actually forced the Kaminoans to greatly expand their infrastructure and production facilities. And so their technology actually directly led to huge economic and social growth. The Kaminoans didn't just focus on genetics, though. They also produced some other equipment for their clones, like their armor and helmets. The Clone Trooper armor was relatively well-designed and protective, and ultimately would serve as the template for the Stormtroopers as well. Kaminoan tech was usually very minimalistic and smartly designed. The Kaminoans also had a good eye for aesthetics as well, and so all of their products looked sleek, modern, and efficient. The same weakness that hurts Kaminoan culture also hurts their technology, and that's because Kaminoan technology was never really derivative of other species' technology. 
Like the Umbarans, the Kaminoans mainly relied on themselves to do research. This means researching technology that could already exist in other parts of the galaxy. Instead of relying on other species' prior work, the Kaminoans wasted resources by conducting parallel research, essentially. Also, when they designed things like the Clone Trooper's armor, their lack of empathy and understanding of humans meant that the armor was extremely uncomfortable and not well fitted for humans. And even though the Kaminoans were quite xenophobic and suspicious of outsiders, they never really heavily invested in military defense and weapons. Instead, they relied on the clone army to provide security for the world, which potentially could have been their biggest and final mistake. Now, I obviously am not a huge fan of the Kaminoans. There's a lot of things about their culture that I dislike, but I think their existence was pretty tough and a lot of the you know, cultural suffering that they experienced as a species led to their current state as Dolphin King. Well guys, let me know in the comment section below which other species you want to see me cover in the future of our Star Wars Faction series. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of this series. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.